Hi, and welcome to the class on multivariable regression examples. Let's start this discussion with a famous data set from a well-known statistics textbook, which is this Swiss fertility data. And it's in the data sets package, so I want to do require, require data sets, and then I want to do data Swiss, and then if you do question mark Swiss, it'll bring up the help file. I have kind of a better formatted version of this on the slide. And so what's in this data set is a standardized fertility measure and a, some socioeconomic status indicators for 47 French-speaking provinces of Switzerland. In, in this is from 1888. So the variables are fertility, agriculture, which is the percentage of the males involved in agriculture as an occupation, and examination, the percentage of draftees that scored a a particular mark on a military examination in the province. Education is the percent of the population that it made it beyond primary school. Catholic is, is uh, you know, in, in this region at this time is just the percent Catholic as opposed to Protestant. And infant mortality is the, the percentage of live births who live less than one year from the province. So that's the data set and we're going to, we're interested in looking in to what explains fertility in this province. So before we go any further, let's do some basic scatter plots of the data. So let me load the Swiss data set and do a pairs plot of all the variables in the data set. Oh, I forgot my R. There we go. And the this library here, G Galley or GG Ally, I think is probably how it's pronounced is a collection of add-on tools for ggplot. In particular, they have a gg pairs command that does a, an equivalent of the r pairs plot. And I think you'll see it here in a, in a second. You'll understand what it does. It's a little bit of a slow plot. Let me zoom in on the plot here. And now what you see is, for example, fertility is on the x-axis for all the plots in this first column. Agriculture is on the x-axis for all of the, or the horizontal axis for all of the plots in this column, and it's on the vertical y-axis on this plot. So hopefully you see how it works. So examination, for example, is on the y-axis for these two plots, and then on the x-axis for these three plots, and so on. The corresponding upper triangular part of this matrix gives the correlation between those two variables. So let's take, for example, fertility and agriculture. Here's the scatter plot. You see it right here. Here's the lowest smooth, which turns out to be fairly linear in this case, and a confidence prediction, confidence band around it. And it suggests that the correlation between the two, the empirical correlation, is 0.35. So let's, in the next subsequent slides, investigate the relationship where agriculture, the percent of the province that works in the agricultural industry, with fertility. Let's fit our fertility, our fertility as an outcome. And the first model I want to fit includes all of the variables as predictors. And I'm doing this more for illustration than I am in the to mimic a real data analysis. I would say in a real data analysis, your first model would probably be fertility with agriculture by itself, or the, the marginal relationship of interest without considering the other variables. But I would just want to show you how to fit all of the variables at once. So if you do fertility tilde period, this period then adds all of the other variables in linearly, no squared terms or anything like that, no interaction terms, all of the remaining variables in the data frame all at once. Saying date equals Swiss tells it that the data set that I want is the Swiss data set. So that's the run of my LM. And notice if you don't, you, you often want to assign the output of your LM to a variable so you can save it later, but this is runs quick enough that I'm just um, printing the output. Now, summary of the output from LM gives a much, gives much more interesting output and then it, and in particular, it gives you this table of all the coefficients, their standard errors, their t-values, and their p-values, but it also gives you a lot of other information. If you just want to grab that coefficient table, you can do dollar sign coefficient on the output of the summary statement, 
and there's just the table by itself. So for example, if you want to use that in some, some subsequent code. So let's focus on this number, negative 0.17. This number is interpreted as the following. We expect a 0.17 decrease. Now decrease because it's negative, right? Okay, so we expect a 0.17 decrease in standardized fertility for every 1% increase in the percentage of males involved in agriculture, holding the other variables constant. So that is interpreted as we hold examination, educa education, percent Catholic and infant mortality constant. This next column, the standard error, 0.07, talks about how precise that variable is. Oh, and before I move on, I should also mention, it's important to note that the percent agriculture is expressed as a percentage rather than a proportion, right? Because a percentage is the proportion times 100, so it would change the scale of the coefficient by a factor of 100, so it's important to note whether or not your whether or not these numbers are percentages or proportions. That's, that would make a big difference in the scale of the coefficient. Okay, so the standard error talks about how precise this coefficient is. It talks about the statistical variability of that coefficient and we get a 0 0.07. If we wanted to perform a hypothesis test that the coefficient for agriculture, beta agri is what I have here on the slide, if we want to test whether or not that's zero, then we would take the estimate, subtract off the hypothesized value, which in this case is zero, and divide it by the standard error of the estimate. So the T statistic is nothing other than the estimate divided by the standard error. We could do that, of course, but R very conveniently goes ahead and gives it to us. It's negative 2.448, but that's simply obtained by dividing negative 0.17 divided by 0.07. That T statistic, we can calculate the probability of getting a T statistic as extreme as that, as small as negative 2.448 or smaller, and because we're doing a two-sided test, we would double that p-value. So you can go through that T calculation if you'd like. Uh, the degrees of freedom are n minus the number of coefficients, including the intercept. And that, but again, R does that on our behalf, and that works out to be 0.4. 018. So by standard thresholding rules, you know, type 1 error rate of say 5%, that would be statistically significant. But let's go through some other models and look at how the process of model selection changes our estimates. So now let's contrast the model with a model having just agriculture in as a predictor. So the previous model had all of our other variables in as predictors. Let's look at one that just looks at this association between fertility and agriculture. So I'm running it and I'm just grabbing the coefficient table so we don't we're not looking at the rest of the R's output but when you do this on your own you'll look at the rest of the summary output from LM. What's interesting is that the agriculture variable is about the same magnitude 0.19 instead of 0.17 however it's changed signs. Instead of agriculture having a negative effect on fertility, it has a positive effect on fertility. So adjusting for these other variables changes the actual direction of the effect of agriculture on fertility. And this is the impact of something so-called Simpson's paradox, or I think it should be called Simpson's perceived paradox, because there's nothing paradoxical about the possibility that accounting for other variables should change the nature of the relationship between a predictor and a response. It actually makes quite a bit of a sense, sense that that would be the case. Notice, of course, both case, in both cases, the agriculture coefficient is strongly statistically significant. So what I'd like to do in the next slide is just create via simulation an example where an effect can reverse itself so that maybe it'll get us thinking about how this could happen. In the end, regression is going to be a dynamic process where you're going to have to think about what variables to include, and you're going to have to make the kind of scientific arguments. If you want, if, if there hasn't been randomization to protect you from confounding, you're going to have to go through a scientific dynamic process of putting confounders in and out and thinking about what they're doing to your effective interest in order to evaluate it. So let's invent a little simulation just to illustrate how this can happen. But there's a variety of ways it can happen, So this and this is just one, but let's just, just so you can see it happen 
as we code it from a real generating process that you can control where you can control everything. So I'm going to assume that I have 100 data points, n is 100, and then my second regressor, x2, is just going to be the values 1 to n. So if you look at x2, it's just 1 to 100. So think of x2 as something that we might measure regularly, like days. So we measured 100 consecutive days. And then x1 is a variable that depends on x2, and it depends on random noise. So let's just make something up. So x1 depends linearly on x2, so it grows linearly with time. So let's say maybe hopefully x1 is your bank account, it's your money, it goes up with time, linearly. And then there's all these random fluctuations that impact your spending, so your money doesn't necessarily always just go up, it goes up and down sporadically, but there's this linear trend of it going up. Okay, so there's my x1, and it's going to look different, right? So if I were to, for example, plot x1, it goes up, but it's got all this random noise around the line. Okay, now y, let's say y is happiness, some measure of happiness. So what happens with y? The true generating model is y is negatively associated with x1. Uh-oh, so money is, so your happiness is negatively associated with your money, I guess. More money, more problems is what that's suggesting. But then it's positively associated with x2. So it goes up with time and down with x1. And this is the correct, and then there's some random normal noise. And this is the correct model because we're using it for simulation. So we know that it's the actual truth. Y, our outcome that we're simulating, depends negatively on x1 with a coefficient of minus 1 and depends positively on x2 with a coefficient of plus 1. Okay? So let's simulate our y. And now let's see what happens if we fit x1 by itself. And what we see is we get this enormous coefficient, 95, which is clearly wrong. It's nothing near the negative 1 that it's supposed to be, or that we would hope it would be. It's in fact quite the opposite. And what's happening? It's sort of picking up this effect, this residual effect of x2, this big line, this big component of x2 that's a, that's a big driver of y is getting picked up in x1, okay? But now, what happens if we fit the correct model, x1 and x2 together? Well, there we get the two correct coefficients, my, about minus 1 for x1 and about minus 1 for x2. So there you can see if you do the correct sort of adjustment, then it should work out. And you can, you can imagine why this would happen. What is regression doing? It's taking x1 and removing the linear effect of x2. So this part right here, this 0 .1, 0.01 x2, should get removed, and that uniform noise that's the correct part of x1 that's unrelated to x2 will get related to the part of y that's unrelated to x2 as well. So let's do some plots to highlight this, just, just to show us how it works a little bit. So I'm going to create a data frame, because ggplot likes data frames. And I can't remember if I loaded ggplot, so let me reload it. And then my plot is going to be, um, it's going to have this data, dat, and the aesthetic is just, I name my variables conveniently y, and then my x variable is going to be x1, so the kind of important variable, x1. And then my color is going to be x2, OK? And then I'm going to, I want my points. And I want the line up, uh, up. I didn't highlight the whole thing. There we go. And then I actually need to plot my plot. So there's my G. So there it is. So you can see the color gradient. Here is X1 as it relates to Y. And you can see the line that it's fitting is not incorrect. There is a clear linear relationship positive linear relationship between x1 and y. However, you can see with x2, which is the color, right, that there's also this clear positive gradient. As y goes up, so does x2. And also you can see as x1 goes up, so does x2. So you can see that sort of confounding that's happening here. So why don't we now see what happens if we plot the residuals, OK? So I created in, in my data frame, I created the residuals where I fit x2 on y. And then I took the residual where I removed x2 from x1. So let's see what happens when we do the residual plot. 
So this should be a plot that would give the slope of this line will be the coefficient from our linear model fit where we include both x1 and x2. Okay, so I'm going to run that. I'm not going to go through the ggplot commands because they're basically the same. And here's the plot. Now you can see that for the residual y and the residual x1, there's a clear negative linear relationship. And if you stare at it enough, you realize that the slope of this line should be around negative 1. And you can see that the x2 variable is clearly not related to the residual x1 variable. Okay, and so that's what linear models is doing. It's removing the x2 from both x1 and y, and that's why you get the sort of correct relationship when you fit both variables. Now this doesn't mean that throwing every variable into your regression model is the right thing to do. There's consequences to throwing in extra variables, unnecessary variables, into your regression relationship. Let's go back to our data set now that we've thought about the idea of multivariable regression a little bit more. Remember, our agriculture effect reversed itself after we included the other variables in the model. And particularly, you'll find that this happens quite a bit when education and examination are included. So educational attainment is negatively correlated with the percent working in agriculture, a correlation of negative 0.64. And you would kind of expect that given where the data was collected and the time period in which it was collected. And in addition, as I mentioned earlier, education and examination are kind of measuring the same thing. Their correlation, those two variables, is 0.7. So they're, they're sort of measuring the same thing. So the question arises, is this a positive association between agriculture and fertility by itself when done via ordinary linear regression? Is that artifactual for not having accounted for these other variables? Education, by the way, does have a stronger effect on fertility. So at the bare minimum, anyone claiming that they did a linear regression with percent of the province working on agriculture and fertility as the outcome and claimed a causal relationship between agriculture and fertility, causal positive relationship, that conclusion would definitely be suspect. First of all, because from observational data like this, it's a little, it's always suspect to make strong causal conclusions without putting a lot of extra work in and thought about your assumptions. But even if you were just willing to claim an association between agriculture and fertility, that also would be suspect because you can so easily break that association and reverse it by the inclusion of other very reasonable variables. I also wanted to show you really quickly what happens if you include a completely unnecessary variable in the model. And what I mean by completely unnecessary is that what if you include a variable that is simply a linear combination of the other variables that you've already included? So you might include an, a variable that's unnecessary but you know is random noise, for example, and that's a different issue. We'll talk about that later. But right now, why don't we see what happens if we include a variable that it, in, in what I'm describing is completely unnecessary. So for example, if I create this variable z, that's nothing other than agriculture plus education added together, well that has no added value. We've already included education and we've already included agriculture in our joint model. So why don't I show you what happens when you fit all of the variables plus this additional variable z. And what you see is our agriculture coefficient hasn't changed. It's negative 0.17 just like before. And our z variable is giving an na. And so whatever it does, whatever r does, is it takes the last sort of completely unnecessary variable included in the model and gives that one an NA coefficient. So that's an important thing to remember if you see an NA uh, in R after you fit a linear model then probably the most likely culprit is you, you've included a variable that is either numerically or exactly a linear combination of the other variables. So you might be surprised to find out how flexible linear regression models are. For example, you can fit factor variables as regressors and come up with things like analysis of variance, if you've heard of that before, as a special case of linear models. Let's go through an example where we have one covariate, x equal to 0 or 1, and let's see what happens when we put that into a linear regression model. 
So here I have my model, y, my outcome, is beta naught, an intercept, plus x times beta 1, plus an error term. Where here now my x only takes the value 0 for, let's say, people in a control group, and 1 for, say, people who received a treatment. Then for the people who received the treatment, the group of people where their x value is 1, their mean is beta naught plus beta 1. For the people who are in the control group, those people where their covariate x is 0, their mean is beta naught. If you were to fit this, as you would expect, the estimated mean for the treated group is just the mean of the people who were treated. So that beta 1 hat plus beta naught hat works out to just be the mean for the treated group. Similarly, beta naught hat by itself works out to be the mean for the control group. Beta 1 now is interpreted as the increase or decrease if it's negative in the mean response for those that had the x value of 1, for those that were treated. So that's just a nice way to be able to fit factor, a two-level factor variable, as a linear regression variable. And it gives you not only the fitted values tell you about the means for both of the groups, but it gives you an inference for comparing the two groups automatically. That t-test, by the way, the t-test for beta 1, is exactly identical to a two-group t-test where you assume a common variance if you happen to ta have taken the inference class. We can extend this to more than two levels. For example, imagine if you had a three-level variable. For example, you have some outcome, but you want to compare it to U.S. political party affiliation. In this case, let's say you, you are only considering those where that were Democrats, Republicans, or registered independents. Well, you can do that by having a variable x1 that's 1 for Republicans and 0 for otherwise, a variable x2 that's 1 for Democrats and 0 for otherwise, and then I'll tell you here in a minute why we omit the x3 that would be 1 for independents and 0 otherwise. That one would happen to be redundant. Okay, so if a person is a Republican, then their mean is going to be beta naught plus this first x term is going to be 1, so plus beta 1, and then the second x term is going to be 0, and so their mean will be beta naught plus beta 1. If the person is a Democrat, then it's going to be beta naught, then x1 will be 0, so that term will drop out, then x2 will be 1, and so it'll be plus beta 2. So for the Democrat, their mean from the regression model will be beta naught plus beta 2. And then if they're an independent, they both these x terms will be 0, and it'll just be beta naught. And that's why we can't include a third term, right? Because if we know that your Republican, in, in the way that we've set up the variable, if we know that you're not Republican and not a Democrat, then you must be an independent in our data set the way we've set things up. And so it would be redundant to have a third variable in there. It wouldn't have any new information. Here we have three means, Republican, Democrat, Independent, in three parameters, beta naught, beta 1, and beta 2. If we were to add an extra parameter, it would um, kind of break the model. And I'll show you in R what happens when you do that in a minute. So if we look at our means here, if we compare beta naught, the mean for the independents, versus the mean for the Republicans, if we subtract those two, we get beta 1. So beta 1 compares Republicans to independents. And beta 2, similarly, compares Democrats to independents. Then, of course, beta 1 minus beta 2 compares Democrats to Republicans. So what happens is, by omitting the regression variable for the independents, then the intercept became the value for the independents, and all of the other coefficients have become interpreted relative to independence. The beta 1 effect, the one in front of the Republican covariate, is now interpreted as the change between Republicans and independents. The beta 2, the one in front of the Democrat covariate, is now interpreted as the change between Democrats and independents. And this was all a consequence of having omitted the one regressor for independence. If we had included the regressor for independence and excluded the one for Republicans, then the intercept would be for Republicans and the coefficient in front of the Democrat one would be Democrats versus Republicans. The coefficient in front of the independent one would be Independents versus Republican. And we'll go through some more examples uh, just to illustrate how this works. And R kind of does this on purpose, or R kind of does this automatically for you if you include it as a factor value. It picks one of the levels to be the reference level. 
And so let's go through some examples. Hopefully that'll shore this up. But the main point I'd like to get across is whenever you're dealing with factor variables and linear models, what you set as your reference level has a big effect. The, these coefficients are interpreted quite differently depending on how you set them up and what you set up as your reference level. Okay, so let's go through an example in R where we look at a factor variable and see how R is treating it. So I want to make sure I require the data sets package. We've already loaded that in in this lecture, but let's just do it again just to remind ourselves. And then I have this data insect sprays. And then I'm requiring the stats package. I don't know if that's technically necessary for what I'm doing. But if you do help insect sprays, insect sprays, here it gives you the help file for this data set and the outcome is a count, it's a numeric uh, insect count so presumably number left after applying the spray and the, the spray factor is the type of spray okay and then it gives some examples of working with this data but you know we don't we don't need that because we're going to use it we're going to build our own examples so let's first let's plot some of the data so I want to do a ggplot and I've already, I've already loaded ggplot2, but just to remind you, in case you're restarting your R session from earlier, you want to make sure that you require ggplot2. There it's loaded. And then I have my ggplot, and then my data is insect sprays, and then for my aesthetic, my y is the count, the number of insects, my x is the spray, There's, they, they don't um, give you too much information about the sprays, but there's a couple of different sprays that they used. And then I want to fill, um, the, fill the objects I'm creating with the factor variable spray. So there I've created my GG plot. And then I want to do a violin plot. A violin plot is kind of like a histogram, but sort of tilted on its side, and then they repeat it on both sides. So it looks like a, um, it looks a little like a violin. Well, it, look, it, it looks like a violin if your data cooperates. Otherwise, it looks like a blob. Okay, there's our violin plot. And then I want to set my labels. And then if you want to actually see the plot, you got to do um, bring it up. Okay, so here's my violin plot. So you see there's um, sprays a, labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, and you can see the insect counts for the, so they applied, I presume they applied this spray to numerous batches of insects and they, um, it's unfortunate they're not, count, they're not telling me whether or not the count is the count of the number of alive or the number dead, but so we don't know if this is a, a better spray, a better, um, you know, let's say it's a mosquito spray or something like that because no one likes mosquitoes. Um, we don't know if this is a better spray or a worse spray. So, but let's talk about how we can test the difference between different factor levels, in this case using linear models. And then at the end I'll talk about some shortcomings of the approach that I'm proposing here. But here's a violin plot and let me just do head um, insect sprays to just show you the beginning the, the data what it looks like that see we have a bunch of counts and then the spray labels very simple data set and so let's look at what happens when we include insect spray as a linear model and y as an outcome so let's fit our model and now what we're fitting is our outcome is the count the number of insects our predictor is the spray which spray was used as a factor variable. It's already a factor variable. And then I give it the data set. And then here, I just want the summary of the output from LN. Again, normally you want to assign your LM to a variable so you can keep, keep it for later. And then I just want to, for, to keep the printing a little bit self-contained, I'm grabbing the coefficient table. And so there you see the intercept spray B, spray C, spray D, spray E, and spray F, and spray A is conspicuously missing. And the idea is that everything here is now in comparison with spray A. So this 0.833 is the change in the mean between spray B and spray A. In this case 14.5, the intercept, is the mean for spray A. And if you look over here at our plot, that seems about right. Look at our violin plot, 14.5 seems about right for spray A. And spray B 
it seems reasonable that it would be off by it would be changed just by a little bit from spray A. Now spray C looks like it has a much lower count, okay? And look, its coefficient is minus 12, okay? And that that looks like about right. So this this one's at 14.5 and you know, somewhere around 2 seems about right for this one, spray C. And so that's exactly what this coefficient is saying. This negative 12 here is the difference between spray C minus spray A. Now if we wanted to compare, for example, spray B and spray C, we would have to subtract this 0.833 and this negative 12. Now we wouldn't have a standard error for that comparison immediately. However, that would give us the estimate. If I were to take the average count for the sprays for the for those um, with spray A, I would get 14.5. If I were to take the average count for spray B, I would get 14.5 plus 8.833. So I'd like now to show you how I can hard code the same model and not rely on R to actually do the to pick the reference level. So remember what I did last time is I did count was my outcome and my factor variable spray was my predictor. And what R does is it picks the spray level that's the lowest alphanumerically, so in this case spray level A, to set as the reference level. So let me show how I can hard code that myself manually. So here count is my outcome and then I'm going to create a variable using uh, the I function which in LM actually performs the operation inside the regression inside the model statement. So I here I just want to look at the instances where the spray is equal to B and then I multiply that times 1 to change it from boolean to um, uh, numeric. And then here's a variable that's 1 when spray is C and 0 otherwise and here's a variable that's 1 when the spray is D and 0 otherwise, and here's one for E, and here's one for F. So I've included all of them except A, so I've forced A to be my reference level, and I'm going to run this model. And it should give me the same result as what R did, it's just now I've shown you exactly how R is creating the regression variables. So let me just remind ourselves what R gives us when we run and let it handle the factor variable by itself and then let me do the same thing where I've created my own factor variables and then you can see 14.5, 14.5, 0 0.833, 0 0.833, you can see that it's identical. So this is what R is doing behind the scenes and let's keep exploring this because this is kind of an important point. If you mess this up with factor variables you get very incorrect conclusions. Now, let me show you what happens if I do include spray A here. So, I've done the same model I did before where I included all the variables, but now I'm also including an extra variable for spray A. And let me just do the LM part. And notice it gives an NA in front of the spray A coefficient. And the reason for that is because it's redundant. We have six means, right, for six sprays and we have seven parameters in intercept and then now I've tried to put in six regression parameters. I have six means to fit seven parameters that can't do that so it's going to drop one of them. Now what if I do want my coefficients instead of being interpreted as levels referenced to a control level, what if I want my coefficients to be the mean for each of the groups. Well you can do that but you have to remove the intercept. So watch what happens when I fit count as my outcome and spray as my predictor but I remove the intercept. Then notice what happens is that now I get a different set of coefficients one for each spray level so it includes A, B, C, D, E, and F. It hasn't dropped any levels and it can do that now because it has six parameters and six means to work with. And these are exactly equal to the means for each spray in the data. So if I were to just go ahead and calculate the means for each spray, right, it works out to be the same numbers, 14.5, 15.3, 2.08 in both, and so on. Now 
I want to emphasize this model is no different than my model that included an intercept. Why don't I go back to my model with my intercept just to illustrate this. So now it's just that the coefficients have a different interpretation. Now the intercept from the model when I fit count as spray but included the intercept, my intercept now is interpreted 14.5 as the mean for spray A. And you can see that it's exactly the empirical mean for spray A when I calculate the mean. It, ha it works out that way. And then spray B, we talked about earlier, was the comparison between the reference level spray A and, the and, and spray B. Okay, so if I add these together, 14.5 and 0 0.833, I should get the mean for spray B. Okay, and that's what you see, 14.5 plus 0.833, that gives me 15.33, and so on. So if I add 14.5 and minus 12, I'm going to get 2.08. If I add 14.5 and negative 9, I get 4.9, and so on. So this model, where I've included an intercept, has all the same information as the model where I omitted the intercept. The only difference is how the coefficients are interpreted. In the model with the intercept, now the intercept is interpreted as the spray A mean, and all the coefficients are interpreted as relative to spray A, differences from spray A. And then if I were to fit it without the intercept, then I get the mean for each spray. And if I want differences, then I have to subtract the coefficients. And you want to do the, you, you usually want one of them to be a reference level because then you can do tests. So now my p-values are testing whether or not, or the, for the t-test is whether or not a is different from b, and a is different from c, and a is different from d, and so on. Whereas the p-values from this test are just testing whether or not those means are different from zero which is a very different test. Did spray A kill any insects is what this is testing, where in this one, the spray B row is testing whether spray A is different from spray B. So what I'm trying to illustrate is that the, how you play around with factor variables in LM is very important in terms of how you interpret it. It's not just a conceptual or theoretical can, uh, thing to worry about. It's a very practical thing to worry about. What your intercept means changes dramatically depending on what your reference level is or whether, you not whether or not you include an intercept. Let me do one last thing where now I show you how you can re-level. In this case, spray A was my reference level. You can very easily re-level it. So say spray C is your reference level. So now here I've just used the re-level command. So now insect spray the reference le level is spray C, but now I've just created a new variable where that's spray two. And now I'm gonna do my linear model where my outcome is my count and spray two is my predictor now instead of spray. And this is the one that has C as the reference level. And then R knows not to do the one that has the lowest alphanumeric letter, but instead has the reference level that I've set. And there when I do it, notice spray A is present, spray C is gone because now it's the reference level. My intercept is interpreted as the mean for spray C, and you can see 2.0833, that's exactly the mean for group C. And then this coefficient, 12.41 here, is interpreted as the comparison of spray A to spray C. This 13.25 is the comparison of spray B to spray C. And so if I wanted to test spray a versus spray C, I could look at this p-value. P if I wanted to test spray B versus spray C, I would look at this p-value. So let me just recap, since this is uh, a very important point. If we include a factor level, factor variable like spray in R, then R automatically includes an intercept and treats the first level of the factor as the reference level. So the intercept now is interpreted as the mean for that reference level. In our example, the intercept is interpreted as the mean for spray A. Then each spray other effect, so spray B effect, spray C effect, spray D effect, spray E effect, and so on, is the comparison of that spray level versus the reference level, which is A. If we want the means for those, it has to be the intercept plus their specific coefficient. So the intercept plus the spray B coefficient will be the mean for spray B. All of the tests then, the test for the intercept will be the, a test for whether or not the mean for spray A is zero. The test for all the other levels, the spray B, spray C, and uh, other coefficients, will be a test for the comparison versus spray A. If on the other hand we omit an intercept, 
then we're going to get a mean for each level, including spray A. And then all the test would be for whether or not the spray A coefficient is different from zero, the one for B would be whether or not the spray B coefficient was zero, and so on, which may or may not be relevant. Usually you want the comparisons, and that's why R's default is to pick one of the levels and treat it as the reference level. However, if you want a different one, if you want B to be the reference level, you just need to use the relevel command. Or if you want to get involved a little bit more in linear models, then you need to go into how you calculate standard errors in more general settings. But that's a little bit more advanced. For right now, if you want to do the comparison, say, between B and C, then my current suggestion is just to relevel so that now B is the reference level and the coefficient for C will now be comparing spray B and spray C. I want to give some caveats about this data analysis that I presented. It's not exactly a complete data analysis. I, I think the modeling the data as if they were normally distributed is perhaps problematic. They're count data, so they're bounded from below by zero. I think it'd probably be a little bit more natural to model this data as if it was uh, Poisson, or at least um, over dispersed Poisson or something like that, which we're going to cover in our GLM version of the class. In addition, the variance is clearly not constant. So what I mean by the variance is I mean the variance around the mean. And it's clearly not constant as our regression models would assume. So this is a potential problem. And the, so our means are probably correct, our estimates are probably correct, but our inferences are surely not. So that, that creates an issue that needs to be handled at some level. And later on in the class, we'll talk about some things for, for handling this and some of the rest you may have to take some further statistical inference classes to deal with some of the more advanced topics, like when the variances are unequal, they call that heteroscedasticity. So let's move on to another example of multivariable regression, a very important example that underlies the topic of so-called ANCOVA. I'd like to go through the, an example to illustrate fitting multiple lines with different intercepts and different slopes. So I'm going to use the Swiss data set that we've looked at previously. And recall, we were trying to model fertility as an outcome as a function, a linear function of agriculture, which is the percent of that province that was working in agriculture as the predictor. Remember that examination and education, really including those, modified the effect of agriculture on fertility. For the time being, let, let's ignore that. And I just want to show you how to fit different lines, one for each group. So let's take the Catholic variable. So if I were, for example, to do hist Swiss star Catholic, notice that it's very bimodal. And that's because most provinces are either majority Catholic or majority Protestant from this time period. So now I'm going to create, using dplyr, a Catholic, a binary Catholic variable, which is one if the province is majority Catholic and zero if it's majority Protestant. So there I now have that variable. Let me do head Swiss and there see now I have this Catholic bin variable. And then now let me plot the data. And what you see now is these two variables, the Catholic bin factor variable that's 0 for majority Protestant and 1 for majority Catholic. And you can see the data there. There are some potential issues with the data and what I'm going to be describing, which is to fit lines to the data, um, particularly these, these kind of outlying-ish looking observations. But I'm going to ignore this now because later on in another lecture we're going to be talking about outliers and influence points. And then also there's the impact of these other variables, how they would relate to these model fits. So let's ignore all that for the time being and simply work on fitting a line where here now we want two separate lines for the one for the Catholic provinces, majority Catholic provinces, and one for the majority Protestant provinces. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. Let me describe some models that we could fit. So here I have given some notation. Y is fertility, X1 is the percent of the province working in agriculture, and X2 is a binary variable where it's 1 if the province is over 50% Catholic and 0 if the province is, over, is majority Protestant. So consider model 1, where we model that our expected Y 
given x1 and x2 is an intercept plus a slope times x1. So that would just be a line and it would disregard the, the religion of the province entirely. Let's consider a second model. Here we have expected value of y given x1 and x2 is beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2. Now, let's think about this. In the event that x2 is equal to 0, if the province is majority, if the province is majority Protestant, then this works out to be beta naught plus beta 1 x1. In the event that x2 is equal to 1, in the event that the province is majority Catholic, this works out to be beta naught plus beta 2, because this term right here is now 1, plus beta 1 x1. So fitting this model, the model that includes x1 and x2, but no interaction, fits two models that have the same slope. These two models have the same slope, but they have different intercepts, beta naught and then beta 1 plus beta 2 for the second intercept. Okay, let's consider one third model. I want now my expected outcome, given my predictors, to be beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3, uh, beta 3 x1 times x2. Now, let's look at what happens. When x2 is 0, this works out to be beta naught, the beta 1 is still there, beta 1 x1 is still there. Beta 2 x2, this term goes, is 0, and beta 3 x1 times x2 is also 0 because x2 is 0 in both those cases. Okay, now let's work on the case when the x2 is, x2 is 1, which is the case when the province is majority Catholic. So we get beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus now beta 2 is this term is present because x2 is 1 and this term is now beta 3 times x1 because remember x2 is equal to 1 in this case that we're considering. Okay, now let's reorganize terms and that's beta naught plus beta 2 there, plus beta 1 plus beta 3 x1. Okay, so what we've seen is if we include an interaction term, then we fit two lines, but now those two lines have different slopes. If we omitted that interaction term, we fit two lines, but they had the same slope. If we include the interaction term, two lines, different slopes, and different intercepts. And the coefficient in front of the Catholic term by itself is going to be the change in the intercept going from Protestant to Catholic, right? Here's the intercept for Protestant and here's the intercept for Catholic. And the beta 3 term, the term in front of the inter inter interaction, is going to be the change from the slope going from Protestant to Catholic, right? So the slope for the when x, x2 equals 1 is beta 1 plus beta 3. It's going to have that extra term in there. Okay, so let's try it with some code, and I hope it'll make sense. Um, and I think it's a little bit easier to see when you actually do the, do the code.
Okay, so let's actually run some of these fits. Let's first just fit the model that doesn't include religion at all. Okay, so it's just fertility is a linear regression with agriculture. Now, I've already created my plot and labeled it G, but I want to save that plot so I can keep adding different things to it. So I'm going to assign that to G1, and then I'm going to add to it a line that grabs the slope, the intercept and the slope from my new fitted, from my new fit, and then let me plot it. Okay, so there's my fitted line, and let me show you my coefficient summaries. So I'm going to do summary of my fitted linear regression, and I'm just going to grab the coefficient table. So here's my intercept, it hits around 60, you can see that right there. And then there's my agriculture slope, which is about 0.19. Okay, so this just disregards the color of the dots. Let's do one now that fits two parallel lines. Okay, so now here my fit, my linear model fit is fertility as agriculture, but now my, my Catholic variable, my percent of the province that's Catholic that I've binarized, I'm going to include it as a factor variable. Because this variable Catholic bin is 0 or 1, remember back from the dummy variables part of the lecture, I don't actually have to have this factor statement because coding a variable as 0 versus 1 treats it as a factor. However, I like to always call things factor variables, and the reason for this is sometimes I have a variable that's 0, 1, 2, for example, for a three-level variable. And if I don't then call that a factor, R is going to treat that as a continuous regressor. It's going to say 2 is twice 1, even if 2 is just a, my numeric coding for representing red hair color and 1 is for, for brown hair color, or something like that, where 2 really has nothing to do with being twice 1 in that case. So I like to get in the habit of calling factor variables always factor in my models just so I don't make that mistake. Now when you print out your summary, you would hopefully notice that there's only one coefficient, and so you would no hopefully notice that you've made that mistake, but this is an easy way to avoid it. I don't maybe always live up to the standard of treating my factor variables always as with the factor statement, but I try. Okay, so there I fit it, and let's, let's first look at the coefficients. So here's the intercept, here's the slope, and the slope is the same regardless of the religion of the province. And then here's the change in the intercept for those that are Catholic, for those provinces that are Catholic. So let's go ahead and plot these. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my, I'm going to copy my old plot that's just the scatter plot, and then I'm going to add two lines to it. One that is the, the line for Protestants, which is just the intercept plus this agriculture slope. And then I'm going to add one that is the line for the, those provinces that are majority Catholic. So my intercept changes by adding the first coefficient, which is the intercept, and the third coefficient, which is this 7.88. But my slope stays the same. It's just the same slope. So let me put that in, and then now let me plot that. And there you see what that looks like. It's two fitted lines where now I've forced the fits to have different intercepts, but they have the same slope. Now let's do some lines where they have different intercepts and different slopes depending on uh, the percent of the province that is Catholic. So this one now I put an asterisk, and I'll describe in a second what this asterisk does. So I did the fit, now I'm going to do summary, fit, star, coef, and maybe it's not the best practice to keep naming your model fits the same exact variable and overriding it. You probably want to save them. So now look what happens. I have an intercept. I have the, my slope. Okay, so this intercept is the intercept for mostly Protestant provinces. This slope is the slope for mostly Protestant provinces. This 2.86 plus 62, that's going to be the intercept for the mostly Catholic provinces. And this slope plus this slope, 0. Uh, you know, 0. 0.1 basically, plus 0. 0.9, that's going to be the slope for the mostly Catholic provinces. So because remember our, our, our coefficients added. What happens when you add an asterisk in between two variables in R? is it automatically fits the interaction, so here's my interaction term, here's my interaction term, plus all the main effects. So here's the main effect for Catholic, 
Here's the main effect for agriculture in the intercept. I'll show you in a minute how you can avoid doing that in R, though you want to be very careful with doing that. In general, you want to include the main effects if you include the interaction. Okay, so now let's plot those two lines. So here I'm going to assign my plot to be this original scatter plot that I keep overwriting. And then I'm going to add two lines to it. The first is the line for the mostly Protestant provinces. There my first coefficient is the intercept and my second coefficient is the slope. Now I'm going to add a line that is the line for the mostly Catholic provinces. So here, here is my intercept, which is the first coefficient, right? The first coefficient, 62 here, plus the third coefficient, right? The one, this one that's the Catholic main effect, okay? And then the slope is going to be the second coefficient, right? This one right here, 0 0.96, plus the fourth coefficient, the interaction term that is agriculture, the slope and the province being mostly Catholic. And let me plot it. There you see it. And so now what we have is two different intercepts and two different slopes. You can see, of course, that these lines are not parallel. So this, and you can see, so you might not know which line is which, but we can guess from the coefficients, right? So the, all the, all the interaction terms, all the Catholic terms were positive. So this line with the slightly higher intercept is going to be the Catholic line, and this line for the slightly lower intercept is going to be the mostly Protestant, so the, the salmon colored dots. Okay? Now I think you can probably see that, well, for the blue dots, it's not clear what these two blue dots over here, how they're impacting the fit, so we might want to investigate that. But that's for, tomorrow, um, for the next lecture where we talk about residuals and influence diagnostics and that sort of thing. The last thing I want to do 